You know, Alan, maybe we should just do a show on road stories. Maybe we should no. do that. Okay. No, no, maybe not. No, no. Yeah, maybe. We're trying to get him to write a book a bit. You folks. said user friendly. You said family friendly. <laughs> That's not a whole show. <laughs> He's whole got show, some friend. doozies, folks. He's got some doozies. Well, this is nothing you're going to record, right? I'm so recording this is it. Going sure. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> do you want to tell some road stories now? The one that I did Tell not the one get about around Arnold to. Inspector. Okay. No, and no, Nixon. no, 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 no. No, I could. That's a fact. You talk about <laughs> strange bedfellows and me being in the same room with those guys. Uh, my the story that I did not get to tell. I'll, I'll I truly did forget that you're on the air right now. But uh, I'll share it because I I didn't get around to it towards the end of the show. Um, my aunt Pearl was notoriously fearful of flying. She would fly for enough money. <laughs> That's the way I'm telling you, because I'm just telling you, I'm telling you the truth. For enough money, she would fly. But if she didn't have to fly, she didn't want to fly. And she had a guy who traveled with her who had been in the chorus in her production of uh, Hello, Dolly in 1969 or whenever it was. And he was a very, very nice guy and a real showbiz veteran. He knew how to handle sound checks and light checks for her so she didn't have to. So he was very valuable and he was her traveling companion. And Louie and I were out on the road and that usually meant flying places, driving places, and ending up in a place for a week or sometimes two weeks at a time. If we were lucky, it was two weeks at a time. We had a regular uh, hit in Chicago on Lakeshore Drive at the Holiday Inn. And there was in the off the lobby a famous jazz club called Rick's Cafe American after Casablanca, right? And it was a very nice club and beautiful, beautiful girls and uh, super nice staff, great sound system, everything. A small band gig. So Louis would put together a quartet or a quintet at most, and we'd be on this gig for two weeks. And I'd get to visit with my friend Barrett Deems, who was one of Louis Armstrong's great drummers and an extraordinary character in his own right, but a wonderful wonderful guy to me and when we had this suite and every year we had the same suite the holiday in there had this 11th floor suite that overlooked uh, Lake Shore Drive and Lake Michigan and it was a great scene for me because I didn't have any money and I didn't have to pay for anything right but except one year where much to Louie's surprise Aunt Pearl actually surprised us with by showing up, having driven from Lake Havasu City, Arizona, she was off of school. Usually during these years, she was in D.C. going to Georgetown University, where ultimately she got a degree in theology uh, after switching her major to her minor. She was going to get a major in French and a minor in theology. And then not long after she started, she switched and I was on the phone with her one day and I said, I, I said, so now you're going to get a major in theology and you're going to minor in French. And she said, yes, sir. And I said, why? Why is that? And she said, Alan, it's easier to know the Lord than it is to know French. And that was her. <laughs> this is the part where you're supposed to laugh out loud, but I don't hear anything. You become more <laughs> oh, self I have the mic muted. That's hilarious. Uh, that's a quote. That's what she said to me. Um, <laughs> So one year right. in, coming from Quebec, I, I one, can tell you she's right. One year in Chicago, we're on the gig, and I'm in the third. I'm on uh, in my own little part of this uh, beautiful suite. Louis's got a bedroom on the opposite end, and then there's this huge, beautiful dining room. I mean, living room with its own dining room and its own kitchen. And then there's another room, and I've got the small room. And all of a sudden, Aunt Pearl shows up, where she has driven. She drove because she was the driver in this relationship. And brought E.B. Smith, her road guy, with her, who was, you know, I was a friend. I mean, he was, I was friends with him, and uh, and their cocker spaniel Charlie, who lived with their next door neighbors in, in Lake Havasu City, next you know, Arizona, next to the house that was largely unattended because Louie and Pearl were never there. So even though Charlie belonged to Louie and Pearl, he didn't really know who the hell these people were. Because all he knew is all of a sudden he got dog napped because this lady, this crazy lady wearing a hat and a, with a big car and some companion comes along and s takes him away from everything that he associated with his own safety and his own, you know, continuity. 
And she sticks him in a car, and he stays in the car for a long time while they drive to Chicago, Illinois. So I thought, what in the world are we going to do? And and I didn't have anything to be concerned about because Louis took care of me. They got me a room, a regular room on the third floor. And one day I was on the phone. Uh, so Louis and Pearl had their room at the one end of the thing. They gave E.B. Smith my room in the suite, and then I got demoted to the third floor, which was fine with me. There was nothing wrong with the room. But one day I'm on the phone with Louie. I'm on the third floor in my room. He's in our suite on the 11th floor, and the phone rings, um, and it's him, and he's talking to me about something that we're going to do, a press thing that is going to be recorded after the gig, and he wants me to go around to the fellows and see if I can... He wants me... I, I shouldn't even say this. He wants me to approach the guys about maybe sticking around a little bit after the gig and doing a little playing in the background or something, and I thought, oh, man, they're not going to want to do that, you know, but... That's what it was about. And so while I'm on the phone with him, I hear in the background Aunt Pearl's unmistakable voice, and she says, oh, Charlie. The dog's name is Charlie, and she's ranting and raving, and I hear it in the background, and Louie gets distracted from the phone, and he looks at her, and he turns away from the phone, and I hear him say, oh, honey, and who knows what's going on, and I'm just sitting there waiting with the phone up to my ear, and eventually... Louis comes back and I said, what in the world is going on? And he said, Aunt Pearl wants you to come up here right away. So I hung up and I ran out the door. I ran down the hall. I ran to the elevator. I pressed up. I got in the elevator. I got to the 11th floor. I went through the doors to get to the wing where this suite was. I banged on the first of three doors to the suite and nothing happened. So I went to the middle door, which is the arguably the main door to the living room where the kitchen was and all that. And the door swings open violently. Boom! And I'm standing there, and she's holding the cocker spaniel, and she foists the dog on me, and she says, Here! And I take Charlie, and she slams the door. I never said one word. This is absolutely, I'm not embellishing this one inch. That is exactly what happened. Charlie got banished from the nice suite, and he spent some part of the rest of the engagement with me in my room, and I was taking care of Charlie. Because whatever Charlie had de- done, whatever was re- whatever he had caused, uh, it was sufficiently offensive to her that he got banished to a less expensive room. And that's that's... That's a road story. So not only were you taking care of Louie, you had to take care of the dog as well. Well, I didn't, yeah, How'd I you didn't get have, on with the dog, by the way? Uh, the dog was great. He was hilarious and cute, and he was bewildered, and I felt so far, sorry for him because I felt like I understood he really did not know what the hell was going on and who these crazy people were. Because he lived with a family that had another dog, and they, they took care of Charlie, took care in quotation marks, which means they raised Charlie. They owned Charlie, you know, to some extent, and then rarely but occasionally Aunt Pearl would show up more often than Louie at that house. They moved from Northridge, California to Lake Havasu City, which is where the London Bridge was reconstructed. But uh, anyway, it was just a funny thing. And and what's classic to me and what is pure Aunt Pearl was that the way she handed me the dog with one word, here, and slammed the door. And then there I am at with against a closed door holding this poor dog who's just sitting there blinking at me like, what the hell was that? You know, and I, <laughs> and so I didn't knock on the door anymore. I just went back downstairs and took care of Charlie. And it was fun. It gave me something to do. Can you tell the Aunt Pearl story where you and Louie are at Disneyland? Well, you we were at Disneyland yeah. a lot. Um, are you talking about the one with the Hell's Angels? You can tell that when I was thinking of the one with the girls. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, the one with the Hell's Angels Go was in, in Anaheim in California, and that was fun. We were there uh, about one week every year at a place called Carnation Plaza, and it was the most wonderful job of its kind that I ever got anywhere near. Uh, he had the big band, some of the guys from The Tonight Show, Pete Kristalieb sometimes, and sometimes Don Menza, and occasionally both of them at the same time fantastic trumpet sections uh bobby shoe and before he passed away mitchell and legendary ultimate guys and it was unbelievable seven days a week the bands would play sunday through saturday and 
Count Basie's band would close Saturday night and Buddy Rich's band would open Sunday night. And or Stan Kitten's band would close, Woody Herman would open, Maynard would close, and Louie would open, whatever. And Louie was doing a lot of, you know, he had some modern charts that he had written and some other people, but he did a lot of kind of what I thought of as real old traditional Ellington stuff. And it was so powerful. It was like, you know, they do things ain't what they used to be. And uh, it was so strong. I couldn't talk for several minutes after it was over. If you've never been on the bandstand, if you've never been in close proximity to one of the ultimate great bands from the old days, you'll, you can't know what it was like. It's like being on stage with a real symphony orchestra. It's an extraordinary experience. And, um, and I was so privileged. We'd be there a lot, or at least several consecutive years. I met all kinds of Hollywood people there. I met um, Robert Blake and, uh, oh, who else? Other people who were fans, Charlie Callis and people who were fans of Louis and buddies and all that. And um, Aunt Pearl would be there sometimes. And if she was there, I would sit with her. Normally, I wouldn't sit at all. Uh, but I would sit with her to be, keep her company and to be there, you know, if she needed anything or whatever. But she would needlepoint. She was always doing needlepoint at this point, And she was inevitably on a diet. And at one point, she's on this uh, popcorn diet. And all, all that I could tell from this is it involved her eating an inordinate quantity of popcorn. She ate a lot of popcorn. Orville Redenbacher's con company had a contract with Disney, so they, they it was all Orville Redenbacher popcorn at Disneyland. And um, and I noticed very early on that she didn't like to sign photographs. She didn't like to get her picture taken. But what she would do is she would be cordial to people who would come up to her, which, which I didn't know until I saw it happen. And it happened a lot. And people would come up and they'd want to get her autograph or take a picture. And she, she'd figure a way diplomatically to say no, but she would have them write down their name and address give she'd say no you give me your autograph and she, she got somebody to give her a little you know their name and address she put it in a little piece of paper and she'd put it in her purse and she'd take her purse home to her secretary and dump out all these little pieces of paper and then she would pay with her production company old bailey production company to send them an autographed eight by ten and she did it a whole lot she did it a lot that was standard operating procedure except when one day we're sitting there and it's either in between sets or probably not, probably the band is playing. Cause if it was in between sets, I would have been with Louie. And, um, I see these three real, real live hell's angels people. And, and so it's like, Oh, look, those are real live, big, scary hell's angels, people, two guys and a girl. The woman was very heavy set, very substantial. And, uh, I watch with dread as the woman, the female Hells Angel type woman, comes over and and approaches us. And I said, uh-oh. And Aunt Pearl looked up and she looks at this woman. And this woman says, and I'm sitting right there. There's a quote. She says, hey, Pearl, can I get your autograph? And I'm waiting for this inevitable thing where she, you know, diplomatically says, well, no, but. And Aunt Pearl says, absolutely. And I fell over. I laughed so hard I couldn't, you know, I mean, it was so funny. And I, I don't know, I'll never know if she did it that way because I was there and because I was the audience for her, because nobody else would have known that that's atypical. But for me, I was, I was, you know, I was hunkering down waiting for the inevitable exchange where she would decline to give an autograph. But in the case of the scary Hell's Angel people, Hell's Angels people, she said, absolutely. And <laughs> I, it makes me laugh every time I think about it because it's the truth. It was really funny, and she was funny. You know, she was genuinely hilarious. She seemed in real life, and at her funeral in uh, Philadelphia, I spoke with the local news people at the um, church uh, where her extraordinary memorial service took place, and. Um, that was something that I could do for Louis so that he didn't have to. So I spoke to local news people and I emphasized that, you know, uh, a person of her stature, it would be in, in terms of all of what she did in her long, extraordinary career, it would be easy, you know, if, 
if she turned out to be kind of like certain other people, many of whom are not what they appear to be. But in her case, she was exactly the way behind the, the way she appeared in front of cameras and in front of audiences is the way she really was in real life behind the scenes. And, and a lot of it was really fun. You know, really, I look back very fondly. My most, one of my genuine regrets is that I got mad at her one time because I was recording uh, a gig with Louie. Uh, he's playing and he's got monster guys, super, super strong guys. And all I, I had this beautiful little Sony stereo portable cassette recorder, recorded very good quality sound of just by pressing two buttons and you, you set it on a table. It's really nice little piece of equipment. And she's sitting next to me and I'm, I never take my eyes off of Louie the whole time he was playing. And she's nudging me, trying to talk to me. The whole time, the whole time, the whole time she's talking to me and literally poking me in the shoulder and pulling my sleeve to get me to look at her while she's talking to me. And she knows what's going on. You have to understand it's a game for her. She knew how annoying she was being to me and she thought it was funny. And it probably was. So that night, after having this horrible, arduous experience of sitting next to her on the gig and not being able to concentrate on Louie and who knows what turned out on the recording... I get up, I get back to my room and I turn on the machine and I listen to what, what, what I recorded and all you can hear is her blabbing nonstop. All you can hear is her talking. And so I was so mad. I deleted, I, I pressed record and I recorded over the whole night, both sides. It was a 45 minute or 45 minutes on each side. And now... <laughs> I really wish I could listen to whatever the heck she was talking to about. I'm sure it wasn't earth shattering, but it would be fun now for me to hear what on earth she was you know, babbling about. And I, but I was so upset that I just said, oh, I'll fix her little wagon. And I, uh, I deleted it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell them one about the girls? It's safe. No, no, no it's no, it's safe. Come no, on. No, I'm going to talk about that. All right. So what about your other surrogate father? Because it sounded like he came out there a little bit. Can you tell any stories about Buddy uh, Rich? Uh, yes, I could. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I could. But, uh, you know, I'd have to think about it. Um, the thing I would want to emphasize is it's really kind of difficult for me to put into words. I'd have to think about it because on the one hand, I'm quite certain he wasn't as bad as people who didn't know him might make him out to be. And on the other hand, I'm absolutely certain he was much worse than they could possibly have imagined. So he was a complicated guy. And uh, the most revealing experience of my time, I was on the inside with him for the last 10 years of his life. I was never his official valet. I was given the opportunity to go out with him it represented a real conflict of interest for me because I had already been hired to be a show drummer and to begin a little tour doing a show. And I didn't have anybody to come in to, to take over that job for me on short notice. And I had a, a, a very important conversation with a guy that I sincerely and really, really admired, a guy named Steve Peck, who was Buddy's road manager. And, um, and we were talking about the concept of me actually finally going out as Buddy's valet. And it, it was, it paid like $5 a day is what it paid. Uh, but you didn't have any expenses. You lived, you know, you'd, I'd share a room with somebody in the band probably. And, uh, and you'd just be on call to do things for him all the time. And I was doing that anyway when I was with him but not as his valet, and I wasn't on the road with the band the way I was on the road with Louis. I was actually traveling with Louis extensively for years. And, um, and Buddy knew that I was close to Louis, and I always felt like that was, he loved Louis in, in a way, I'm sure he did. Um, they, they had an understanding based upon the familiarity, the commonality of some of their experiences as ultimate veterans there was genuine respect and some real brotherly affection between them i saw it for real behind the scenes it wasn't jive i think they they had love for each other i think buddy loved louis you know and um and the the experience of talking to steve peck about going out on the road with buddy for real for however long it would last i was panic stricken because i thought well this does represent 
on a very valuable opportunity. You know, what's it worth to get paid? Well, not much, but to be there every night and watch him play night after night after night and to absorb as much as you possibly could because the guy was he was capable of doing things that were that seemed to me, having been playing since I was five years old, um, he was capable at when you least expected it of something coming out that was simply impossible, uh, absolutely bewildering in terms of what he was capable of doing. And the, you never really got a sense of that if you only saw him on The Tonight Show. You had to hear it live. You had to see it live. And I was so privileged to have spent so much time with him. I set up his drums 50 times without exaggeration. I, I, I knew every inch inside and out of his setup and of you know, his attitude and how to read him and when to hide in a, in a <clears throat> dressing room behind the, the house with the lights out <clears throat> to dart, dart into a dark dressing room and hide against the wall when he was passed, if he was in a, one of those moods, which was rare, but when it was, it was happening, it was unbelievable. And I'll, I'll tell you this moment of realization for me. It was a fork in the road for me. Uh, I'm on the phone with Steve Peck, and I said, you know, if somebody's going to go out with him, I suppose I should, because, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm qualified to, to do that, because I get him, and I, you know, and I said, but the thing that concerns me is I've been playing since I was five years old, and I would need to be able to play somehow, some way to practice, even if it's just on a practice pad. I said, I can't not play. And he said, well, I'm not concerned about that. We could figure something out. I said, but I can't play around him. I can't play around him. I, you know, I, I was so scared. I was so intimidated being around him that when he caught me with sticks in my hand, if I was twirling them or God forbid, if I was sitting behind the drums and I had sticks in my hand, I'd put them down immediately. I'd put the sticks down immediately. You know, I couldn't play around him. I could play around Louie because I was a lot closer to Louie. He was like my father. And I did play a lot with Louie at clinics and at concerts and other things. Um, had a different type of familiarity there, comfort level. And with Buddy, I never got over that intimidation, you know. Um, so I said to Steve, I said, I'm just concerned that I, I would never be able to play. And he said, well, I'm, I think we could work something out. We could figure something out. And he said, I can always talk to the old man, meaning Buddy. He says, but that's not what concerns me. What concerns me is that you're used to being around Louie, and Louie's a real sweetheart. And and here's here's the money shot. Here's the point that changed my life in that in that moment. He said, but you're used to being around Louie, who's a real sweetheart, and I'd hate to see you lose your love for Buddy because he's subhuman. And when Steve Peck said that to me, I didn't have to be told twice I it literally was like a switch got turned because I respected Steve, Steve so much and I knew he knew what he was talking about. And I, I should be guarded about confiding this story. I haven't told it publicly, but it is absolutely true. And it, it doesn't mean to say that Buddy was, you know, the worst person in the world or that he was horrible all the time. But it is a revealing statement by someone who knew him extremely well and who worked behind the scenes uh, sometimes to smooth things over. He was the main point of contact with all the young fellas in the band. There was only one veteran in the band, the great Steve Marcus. Everybody else was very young, usually, right out of college. And, uh, you know, Steve was used to, he was a psychologist. I mean, he was really, he was really the best guy who I felt most qualified person in the world uh, to be in the position he was in. And I took very seriously what he said, and I went off and did my little tour. And then when I could see Buddy, I would have a reunion with him, but not for more than one day at a time, usually. And we never talked about me going out with him in that capacity. I don't know why, but it, we just never did. There were some poignant moments with Buddy as well. Mm-hmm. Can you tell him one of those, you know, when you got him the nice little video thing to put on the bus and he was well, so grateful? Well, you know, I mean, he he was uh, a sentimental person. He was very sentimental. Uh, I would say at times he was rather emotional, um, you know, and 
I, I really the best the video stuff was helpful because he loved movies old movies uh, more than anything else he loved old movies to have a vcr on the bus and to be able to watch movies i bought him movies for the thing i remember i bought him the magnificent seven and um the guns of navarone which he loved and he you know there were all kinds of great people he was a great fan of people who did great things and he was very sincere about that. I felt like he was um, a, a really kind of uh, had a predicament. And the predicament was he did one thing better than everybody else in the world, period. But he, he didn't have much in the way of a formal education. So there was a combination of unbelievable arrogance or self-confidence, to put it nicely, and unbelievable um, you know, lack of uh, confidence because he probably felt that he didn't have, you know, a very good education. I, I, I think it's possible that his sisters did most of the homework that was sent out to him, you know, from New York by the school that did the mail order stuff. You had a subscription to a school for entertainers and he was you know he toured alaska as a solo act when he was six years old his family was went along but they weren't doing anything it was his act and so he he never i don't think he ever spent a day in a real school and uh and then when he got in the service he had some conflicts but let me just put it like that i've gotten some real inside scoop about what it what he experienced in the service and let's just say to put it gently he had a tough time adjusting to the idea of not being treated like, you know, he was somebody. And he didn't do very well, you know, working in latrines and stuff like that or dealing with superiors. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't wired to do that very well. And you can only imagine how he got along with Frank Sinatra during their first year together on Tommy Dorsey's band. Where, ironically, probably because Tommy Dorsey was so funny in a way made sure that they were roommates. <laughs> See, Tommy Dorsey was a real tough guy. I think in those days, Buddy and, and Frank were, my, my impression is that they, they wanted to be tough guys. They were want to be tough guys. But Tommy Dorsey, he was actually a tough guy. There was nothing want to be about it. And you better watch out, especially if he was drinking. So lots of interesting experiences. Uh, my I was, I my name was on a short list of people who were allowed to get through to his room after he had a quadruple bypass operation in Michigan, uh, which gave him an extra three years of life. He got to know his grandson, which was so important to him. Thereafter, I was never aware of him smoking anything again, even though up until then he was always smoking stuff. I had a lot of funny scenes with him when he was so stoned he couldn't even talk, uh, like dealing with guys who come up with their little kid and they, he, you know, the kid has no idea who Buddy is, but it's a big deal to the grandfather or the father. And Buddy's so stoned he can't even talk, you know, and so I'm trying to be, <laughs> oh man. It's a different world for me. It's so long ago. I can't believe it. But I feel very privileged and grateful. And I can tell you in all honesty, I did love that guy. And um, and he was uh, an incredibly unique and powerful personality that had personally impacted my life in, in major ways. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now, www.nightfrightshow.com. Could you tell a story about Buddy when you and him were making your way down through the club and the band was on the stage and the waiter said, are you with well, the band? Uh, I was, well, this happened several different this times. Is funny. This happened several different times and it did indeed happen with me and I could tell you exactly where we were when it happened. Uh, uh, it was not a waiter, it was a manager. It was a guy in a suit 
and we came in late. The band was already up there, and it was standing room only. I'm not going to say where it is. I'm not going to say where it was, but I do remember. I actually do. And we walked in, and I was wearing my official Buddy Rich T-shirt, and I don't know what Buddy was wearing, probably just a shirt and a sweater. And I came off the bus with him. The other guys, I, the other guys had, you know, the band was all set up. They were already up there, and we came in, and the first thing that happened, because I was walking in front of Buddy, was he, the guy says, uh, "What can we do for you?" And I said, "I think we're okay," or something like that. And, uh, and, and then I kept walking and the guy blocked me and said, uh, are you with the band? And I turned and I pointed at buddy and he says, I, man, I am the band. And he says, Oh, okay. Yeah. It wasn't quite, I am the band folks. It was, I am the mm band. So well, yeah, there you go. You don't want to provoke, you don't want to poke him, you know, for God's <laughs> sake. The thing I lived in dread of, and I was with him, I dreaded the thought of stupid people interacting with him and provoking him because he could easily be provoked. And it was like, oh, please just let us get through this, you know. But anyway, and I saw him play when he was enraged and all, and those rare occasions, one in particular, because he saw somebody recording in a theater where I couldn't be out front. So there, there, there were sort of wings a little bit, and I was in the wings with Steve Peck. And all of a sudden, Buddy stopped the band in a tune, stopped the band. What the hell was that? Oh, I, the, the station dropped us for a few seconds, so we're just back on air now, if that's okay. Well, whatever. Anyway, so Buddy stopped and didn't say anything, and we were like, what's going on, you know? And then all of a sudden, Buddy rubs his chin and starts talking to this guy out there. He saw the red light in the dark of recording, and it pissed him off because he wanted. He said, "He said that's why we make al albums." He's and eventually he said he started up again, played a little bit, and then he stopped again, and he says, "If you record this, I'll break your skull, my man." And uh, it was like, Ooh, you know, and then he played the most insane, furious stuff I'd ever seen him play. And it was unbelievable. And I remember one time on a gig where there were no wings, it was in a hotel ballroom and there were no wings. And I had asked him because I was hyper conscientious about being courteous and being polite without being told that's what he would respect. And that's what you needed to do. If you were going to deal with him, I asked him before the gig, would you, would it be all right with you if I put a chair down here behind the drum riser? So the band's built up in front of me. I was on the stage on the floor, but I was behind the whole band in between where the bass player was and, and the uh, drum set. So I had a perfect eye line to look up and watch him play and during the break he'd caught me in between shows in the dressing room he caught me playing the sticks back and forth together blur, 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 like that and then he and he caught me and it scared me to death and I put the sticks down immediately which is the entire history of my experience playing in front of him and then during his big solo of the very next set he glanced over his shoulder and made eye contact with me while he was playing and I froze like the proverbial deer in the headlights and he and he did playing between the rim and the sticks in the air and back on the rim and then the sticks in the air. And it totally knocked me out. And I know that what he was doing was all of a sudden he remembered that he caught me doing that, uh, you know, a half an hour earlier, an hour earlier. And now he he checks over his shoulder and he, it's like, hey, kid, pay attention, you know, watch this. So I think I influenced one of his solos. <laughs> and that's what happened. What did you learn from him, and what did you learn from Louis? Well, I don't Doesn't know. Doesn't necessarily have to be. I I learned how to be more like Louis and less like Buddy. I think that's <laughs> the main thing I learned is you know don't be a carbon copy of anybody. You know, love who you love and be open to all kinds of things, and don't be rigid in thinking that it has to be this way at the exclusion of somebody else's way. Because for many, many years, I thought in terms of if, if Louis or Buddy did it one way, that means to do it a different way was wrong, and that was absurd because there are a lot of great musicians that they loved who didn't, who sounded like individuals, and I appreciate that. So, you know, to be musical, to 
to be deeply immersed in the sort of um, philosophy, the metaphysics of being the music, as opposed to playing a beat on top of the music, to being open to what's going on around you, to be perceptive and to as instantaneously as possible respond to what's going on around you in a way that is reasonable and and has balance and has aesthetic harmony as opposed to saying hey look at me because i can play really fast that's good advice and i i agree with you you have to orchestrate things not only just you know come through with yeah, it's painting skills. it's painting yeah. with sound painting exactly. with sound and there's I... a wonderful story too that's very very funny and it involves both louie and buddy rich oh, and yeah? that deals with a missing snare drum can you tell that one well, I mean, that happened a couple of times again. It happened more than once. And I was not present on either of these occasions, although I was with both of them on several occasions where they played big drum battles, where both bands were together and they did big drum battles. And man, that was absolutely paralyzing to me. Uh, but I know that when Louis was playing, I think, with uh, Tommy Dorsey's band, having taken Alvin Stoller's place. So there's a great, great drummer, truly great unsung hero named Alvin Stoller. And he followed Buddy on uh, Tommy Dorsey's band, I think. And, um, and he was a great drummer. He's on Ella Fitzgerald sings the Duke Ellington songbook and lots of other classic recordings, recorded all the stuff with, uh, with Fred Astaire and, you know, was, was at Capitol Records for a long time. And, um, and Louis was playing Gretsch drums, and Buddy liked the snare drum. And they were friends, you know, they were friends. And so they hung out during the afternoon. And then Louis went up to his hotel to the room to get ready for the gig. And the gig was in the ballroom of the hotel they were staying in. And Louis comes downstairs, his hi hat cymbals and his snare drum are gone. So it wasn't just his snare drum, it was it was his hi hat cymbals and his snare drum. And so he goes down, there was a band boy, he says, where's my snare drum? He said, Buddy Rich said you said he could have them. What? <laughs> Mel Torme told that story. He didn't get it exactly right, but it was pretty close. And um, that's true of a couple of things that Mel wrote about in his book. But, um, but that was funny. And then uh, in London... Uh, they did a thing in the early 70s, uh, Conversations. I should be able to remember that. It's the name of my, my interview program. And uh, it was with a big band, and Buddy did not want to rehearse in the afternoon, which did not serve the interest of the band, who was playing a very complicated big band arrangement of something, uh, where eventually not only Louis and Buddy, but also great... Uh, British drummer named Kenny Clare did some drum stuff, which eventually was, you know, by by including Kenny Clare, it wasn't just like, okay, Buddy Rich versus Louis Belson, you know, even though they did that sometimes. These were pieces of music uh, which included an ultimate big concerto type suite um, so that all three drummers could be featured. And when and you don't hear this in the the recording but when they actually did the thing um louis had stolen buddy's snare drum i think and buddy took one of louis cymbals and so it took it was all prank stuff and it was funny uh, buddy louis was there for the rehearsal kenny claire was there for the rehearsal buddy was not interested in rehearsing he didn't want to do it like that don't know why his snare drum sounded fantastic, and I learned years later that it was a custom snare drum made by a, a drum shop in London. I always thought it was his Fibes snare drum, but it was not. He, it was this incredibly great wood shell, I think it was wood shell drum in, from London, and that's all I know. Louis, double bass drum, can you talk about that? He first guy to do it. He, he, I don't know if he was the first guy or not. There's been, you know, discussion about a great guy that I ended up meeting when he came backstage one time with Buddy. We were in Sarasota, Florida, and uh, uh, a page or a staff guy to the house came backstage in the, well, before the gig, I think, or maybe during the intermission, I can't remember. And he says, Buddy, a guy named Ray McKinley is here. And 
And Buddy said, Ray McKinley. And he, of course, was famous, phenomenally talented guy, great arranger. I mean, a really good drummer, meat and potatoes, great drummer, and took over Glenn Miller's band after Glenn Miller died and um, uh, had a summer replacement TV show in the 50s. You can find some of that, and it's so good. They do an arrangement of Back Home Again in Indiana that is fantastic, and he could sing. He could do all kinds of things, and by this point, he's a very old man, and he, sure enough, he comes back. Buddy says, yeah, so the guy lets him come back, and he comes back, and eventually Buddy lets him sit in. I believe I understand that Ray McKinley had two bass drums on uh, some recording of something at some point, or maybe it wasn't recorded, and it was because he couldn't play the bass drum fast enough to play some fast boogie-woogie thing. So he he set it up like it was a one-time thing. And I think Louis wasn't aware of that, but Louis's position, as I understood it, was that he had designed a drum set with while he was in high school uh, for an art project where he drew a drum set with two bass drums. And then if you see... Uh, whatever the name of that Danny Kaye movie is, um, where Benny Goodman plays a square, you know, uh, legit guy, and all the heavy guys are in it. You know, it's beautiful. Louis Armstrong's in it, and the magnificent Golden Gate Quartet, my favorite gospel group of all time, and Tommy Dorsey, and a whole bunch of other guys. Louis using this double bass set with a whole bunch of toms, a great big tom in the middle, and a whole bunch of little toms all the way around. And it, it's a, you know, it's a nice scene. So I think Louis was the first guy who really used it on a gig as a regular thing, and not exclusively as a gimmick to say, hey, you know, I'm different than these other dubious guys who only use one bass drum. Uh, he really did it, and he wrote a tune while he was with um, uh, Harry James called The Hawk Talks and uh, brought it to Billy Strayhorn, and Strayhorn liked it and gave it to Duke, and Duke said, yeah, let's record it. So they recorded it, and then they did the ultimate Ellington studio recording during Louis' time with Duke Ellington called Ellington Uptown, 1952, 51 or 52. And on that recording... They recorded not only the Hawk Top Talks, which was a Louis Belson composition, but also Skin Deep. And that's the one that made drummers all over the United States, maybe all over the world, just shake their head. They couldn't, they wanted to see what it looked like. I talked to Grady Tate about it one time because he told me that, you know, once they heard that, they thought, how is he doing this? What, what is, what's going on? No one had done it at that point. Least of all, somebody like Ray McKinley, he wasn't a great soloist. You know, he was a great drummer, great musician. But he wasn't doing great big huge drum features that would blow the walls down. And that's what this was, you know. So I think Louis was an, an innovator and uh, brilliant um, and generous person, brilliant, generous musician. Also, two separate bass drum pedals, folks, in those days. Nowadays, you see a lot of people with two bass drums, sometimes four, Van Halen. What it is, it's, it's a single bass drum pedal hooked up. And so th what I'm trying to say is when you have two separate bass drum pedals, they're never identical. So you, all those inflections and all those little nuances from one pedal to the other, you have to account for it because you've got to be in time. So it's not like today, the guys that play today, that's why they go, because it's one single bass drum pedal. They don't have to worry about being in time and all the little inflections that are caused by that. You mentioned Mel Torme before. There's a very funny story about Mel Torme, that you met him twice? I met him twice. I knew him for, I knew him for many, many years. I knew him for many years. His Can drummer, tell Dan, story Donnie Oswald. you knocked on the door and introduced your oh, girlfriend to him? Oh, I forgot about that. Well, I, uh, I don't know where you got the idea that I met him twice. I mean, I knew him well enough that he took a call from me the day of Buddy Rich's funeral. When he got home, I got to talk to him on the phone, and he gave me a report on what happened at Buddy's funeral, and that's a fact. Um, and I'll never forget it. It was really quite a day. Um, Do you want to tell that story first? No. Okay. Um, the, the thing that you're referring to was on Valentine's Day, where I did not know that Mel Torme was coming to a city close to where I was living. I had a beautiful girlfriend. 
and it was Valentine's Day, and I was a typical young man who really didn't have, you know, much in mind to make Valentine's Day special for my beautiful girlfriend until my friend Donny Osborne called me, and he was Mel Torme's drummer for many years, and he called me, and he says, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not doing anything. And he says, well, do you want to come up to this thing? There's a symphony gig. I think it was a symphony gig. I can't remember to tell you the truth. I think it was a symphony gig. So Torme came to town with a trio and I hadn't heard about it, didn't know anything about it. And all of a sudden I say, yes, can I bring my girlfriend? And he said, yes, we'll get you in. So I said, where are you? And he told me which hotel it was. And I thought I heard what room he said he was in. And maybe he gave me the wrong room number. I think that's absolutely possible. So I told my girlfriend, hey, because I'm so awesome and because you're so lucky, I'm going to take you out on, on Valentine's Day and I'm not going to tell you where we're going. And she said, oh, great. And I said, so get all dressed up. We're going up to this other city. And she said, okay. So she gets all dressed up and she's beautiful. She looks great and everything's fun. And instead of taking her to a restaurant, I take her to a hotel. And all of a sudden she's like, hey, now what the hell? You know, we could have stayed home for this. And I go up to the ninth floor of this hotel, and I, I knock on the door. And Mel Torme opens the door, standing with a tuck shirt and, and his, his boxer shorts and his socks. And my girlfriend is standing there. And, and he just looked at us. He didn't cover up. He says, oh, hey, Alan. He, he knew my name. He says, oh, hey, Alan. And I said, I, I, he says, are you looking for Donnie? And I said, yes. And he says, He's over there. He's in that room over there. And, and he says, so we'll see you later on. We'll see you tonight. And I said, yeah, thank you. And so then I, so then, so my girlfriend is thinking, hey, now, isn't that Mel Torme <laughs> in his underwear? So that was funny. You know, you surprised me. I kind of had forgotten about that. And apparently you had, don't let absolutely everything I say slip through one ear and with a mighty whooshing sound go straight out the other. But sometimes I do. Folks, you have to realize we Skype a lot. He tells these stories. And of course, I absorb them because I'm a musician, too. <laughs> these are wonderful stories, Alan, and they deserve to be in a book and so much more. That's I'm just good. saying because, you know, these it's history. It's American history, for goodness well, sake. It's fun. I mean, it was fun. All that kind of stuff was a lot of fun. Um, there are many, many more. Uh, I'm just trying to think of a few. Um Oh, the fellow, the sax player. Uh, I, I can't think of his name. Sam Butera. Thank you very much. Can you tell, why, uh, we've only got like five minutes. Can you tell a Sam Butera story very quickly? Uh, are we allowed to use the F word? Uh, uh, just say frickin'. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Sam Butera was Louis Prima's band leader for 23 and a half years, although technically I suppose you might it's not irrelevant that Louis Prima was in a coma during the last three years of that period, but Sam Butera was the hardest swinging and the greatest entertaining tenor saxophone player I think that ever lived. Um, he was made out of swing juice. He was from New Orleans, Louisiana. His people were Sicilian. Uh, he was he was the real thing, and he helped Louis Prima and Keeley Smith redefine their act so that they became the hottest act in showbiz. And it was not happening until Sam Butera came into the scene and they reinvented the Las Vegas lounge scene. And Sam was my great friend. He was like family to me. And uh, I remember being with him when he got his first cell phone. And then thereafter, we were riding around in a little mini bus or something that the house, whoever, wherever the gig was, they sent a little mini bus to pick up the fellows in the band. I'm sitting next to Sam. And he's got his phone in his pocket, and he, he's, he's never had a phone in his pocket. It's news to him. And he, uh, the trombone player is a young man and who was with him at this point, and he has the new phone number because Sam made a big deal about making sure everybody's got his number. So surreptitiously on his side, he, I see him fiddling with his phone. He's calling Sam's number. So all of a sudden we hear Sam's phone ring. And everybody on the bus hears F Sam's phone ring except Sam. So I say, Sam, your phone. He says, huh? And I said, your phone. So we loved Sam, but he was kind of a cartoon caveman and the most profane man on earth. And he's so close to Sam Giancana that Sam Giancana gave him a Jaguar convertible in 1959. So, so that's an interesting and strange thing. But Sam was 
I, I loved him, and he was like family to me, and I miss him. On this occasion, as soon as he fumbles through his pocket, gets the phone out, and turns it on to say, hello, hello, the kid across the, the aisle ends the call. And he's just messing with Sam. And so Sam says, oh, and I said, well, that's okay. So he puts the phone back in his pocket. As soon as he puts it back in his pocket, the trombone player presses the button again. And so his phone rings. You should open your mic because I can't hear what you're saying. So it's no, just as well because I'm just laughing. So, my head off, folks. well, let yourself do that. It gives <laughs> no, me it something to work noise, against. So. It causes so the feedback thing. Don't the worry. Point, Don't worry. The point that is to be made here is that the kid, the trombone player, does this about nine times. And every single time, it makes Sam react harshly. And then hurry. And I said, hurry, hurry, hurry. And then he, oh, he says, hello, hello. And then the guy hangs up and Sam says, I don't hear a freaking thing. <laughs> Only he didn't say freaking. And it was just fun being around him. He was a legendary guy. He he knew everybody. He went out with Sinatra for several months after Louis Prima died. Sinatra loved him. He introduced Frank Sinatra to Jilly Russo, who became Sinatra's right hand man for at least twenty five years. And um and he was an extraordinary musician and a great entertainer and i loved him a lot uh, but the stuff behind the scenes he had a line we'd be in some place and he'd want to go to walmart i sometimes i had a car depending on if we were on the east coast and uh and so i'd drive him to walmart and he'd ask me if i wanted anything and i'd say no sam he said because you know if you can't find it at walmart you don't know what the f you want which really, when you think about it, makes no sense whatsoever. If you can't find it at Walmart, you don't know what the F you want. Uh, but he bought me like a, a razor, you know, <laughs> he bought me a razor at his house. He literally gave me saltine crackers and an old can of spray cheese. He said, here you go, babe. And that's, <laughs> and and he was fun. He was a lot of fun. I, and he recorded with me. He recorded uh, five Ooh. months, two weeks, two days with me and that's a pretty swing that's track pretty cool we're, we're yeah. gonna have to wrap up because i'm looking at the time but i just want to arc this in i want to arc it back to the to the first show we did tell uh -huh. the folks who momo was momo giancana sam well, giancana you mentioned his name well what is there to say he was a figure of authority in the american mafia he was someone that was brought into the anti-castro plots prior to president kennedy's um, nomination as the Democratic Party candidate for the presidency. And he's a person that is uh, deeply integrated into elements of the areas that we are interested in learning as much about as we can. Uh, he had an associate named Richard Kane, who's a figure of interest to people who are interested in surveillance and how Mexico City was wired up, uh, uh, foreign um, embassies fired up. Saved Important by the guy. music. Important guy. Alan, thank you so much for those stories. They're so rich and entertaining that, you know, it's just wonderful. And I'll leave it up to you if you want me to put them up or not. I'll completely yeah, no up problem. your choice. Yeah, a... Okay, we'll talk some more. I'm okay. Brent Holland from the Brent Holland Show. Thank you all so much for joining this impromptu little interview with uh, Alan Dale. See you next time.